my fellow Americans. Not long ago, I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, Dear Mr. President, in my humble way, I am writing to you about the crisis in Vietnam. I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war. But now, this time, it's just something that I don't understand. Why? Why Vietnam? Why Vietnam? We do not seek the destruction of any government, nor do we covet a foot of any territory. But we insist, and we will always insist, that the people of South Vietnam shall have the right of choice, the right to shape their own destiny in free elections in the South or throughout all Vietnam under international supervision. And they shall not have any government imposed upon them by force and terror, so long as we can prevent it. We do not want an expanding struggle with consequences that no one can foresee, nor will we bluster or bully or flaunt our power. But we will not surrender, and we will not retreat. The answer to American offers to move from the battlefield to the conference table continues to come in the form of high explosives aimed at American air bases and other troop installations in the South, including the barracks of American servicemen. But in this war against people, the high explosives are not only aimed at men who bear arms, the American Embassy in Saigon itself becomes a grim battleground scene as Viet Cong terrorists single it out for a bomb attack. It is all part of the carefully planned and continuing campaign of terror against both American and South Vietnamese civilians. Increasingly now, Americans are functioning directly in the fight for freedom in this far, foreign corner of the earth. The risks are real, just as the stakes for which they are taken are real. But Americans risk, and sometimes give, all that they have half a world away from home because they know that once again, half a world away has become our front door. If freedom is to survive in any American hometown, it must be preserved in such places as South Vietnam. And as President Johnson has pointed out, it is up to us. Most of the non-communist nations of Asia cannot by themselves and alone resist the growing might and the grasping ambition of Asian communism. Because this is true, and because we are a nation which honors its commitments, and a people committed to our honor, we intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to meet this mounting aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. For the first time, combat units of the United States Marine Corps arrive in Vietnam, joining other Marines already there. It is the first time that Marines in full combat gear have hit the beach in an active combat zone since Korea. Army combat units also arrive, and the message of their presence on Vietnamese soil is plain. Whatever the present or future needs of the fight for freedom in Vietnam, 
they will be met. American forces in Vietnam know that the communist so-called war of liberation is no less a form of aggression than was the conventional attack in Korea. And they know that this new form of aggression must be defeated and proven unprofitable, or the communists will be encouraged to try it elsewhere with greater confidence and resources. So the war goes on. Clearly, it is the communists who have made that choice. And as always, the innocent suffer. For the children of Vietnam and of all Southeast Asia, the future is in the balance. If they are to realize their heritage as free men tomorrow, there are for us today hard realities to be faced. I do not find it easy to send the flower of our youth, our finest young men, into battle. I have seen them in a thousand streets of a hundred towns in every state in this union, working and laughing and building and filled with hope and life. But as long as there are men who hate and destroy, we must have the courage to resist. We did not choose to be the guardians at the gate, but there is no one else. Nor would surrender in Vietnam bring peace, because we learned from Hitler at Munich that success only feeds the appetite of aggression. Moreover, we were in Vietnam to fulfill one of the most solemn pledges of the American nation. Three presidents, President Eisenhower, President Kennedy, and your present president, over 11 years have committed themselves and have promised to help defend this small and valiant nation. Strengthened by that promise, the people of South Vietnam have fought for many long years. Thousands of them have died. Thousands more have been crippled and scarred by war. And we just cannot now dishonor our word or abandon our commitments, or leave those who believed us and who trusted us to the terror and repression and murder that would follow. This then, my fellow Americans, is why we're in Vietnam.